Well, good morning and thank you for allowing Family Life to come into your home. Our prayer and hope is that you will be encouraged and uplifted as we take our eyes off all of our surroundings and circumstances and bring them back on God. Just a little word of encouragement. I know it's getting a little bit tough uh, staying at home and doing different things and it's starting to get old. You know, a couple weeks was okay, but now we're into three and four weeks, and it looks like three or four weeks more. And I just want to encourage you that as we meet today, we're seven days closer to the end of this thing as we were last week. So just, just want to encourage you every day, we're closer to a breakthrough, so don't be discouraged. Uh, don't let yourself fall into discouragement or depression. You know, the last few weeks we've been talking about how to live by faith instead of fear. How to make sure that our faith stays above our fear. If we can keep our faith above our fear, uh, everything's going to be okay. But when we start to become overwhelmed and overcome by fear, it's very dangerous uh, for, for our lives. But whenever we face a crisis situation, uh, for example, this coronavirus pandemic, whenever we face a crisis situation, there's always a battle inside of us between faith and fear. And, and as long as faith is winning, our faith is stronger, we're going to make it through okay. But if we ever let fear overcome our faith, it becomes a very difficult for us. So I wanted to start this morning off with a question. And, and the, question, the question is this, how can we make sure that our faith wins the day? What can we do to make sure our faith uh, rises above and is stronger than our fear? And there's a simple answer to this, and uh, it may be simple, but it may be harder to do. Whichever one you feed will become the strongest. Both faith and fear, they need nutrition to grow. And so whichever one you feed, that's the one that's going to be stronger in your life. You know, I was doing some yard work this week, and, and I realized uh, that my grass, it looked terrible. I had, I had clovers and dollar weeds and all kind of miscellaneous weeds growing up in my grass, and uh, it just looked horrible. And, and so I went to Home Depot, and I bought some Scott's Triple Action, you know, weed and feed, ant killer, turf builder. I mowed my grass, put on a heavy dose of fertilizer, turned my sprinklers on, and you know, it was a miracle. Uh, within three days, two to three days, my grass is starting to turn green. Uh, the weeds are, are starting to die. And, uh, you know, the problem was not the weeds. The problem that my grass did not have the nutrition uh, that it needed uh, to grow after coming through the winter. And this is a simple analogy, but it bears some truth in our lives. Every day we're making decisions. Every day we're making choices uh, to feed our faith or to feed our fear. And whichever one gets the nutrition wins. Whichever one uh, gets the most nutrition becomes the strongest. And so our fears feed on the natural circumstances around us. And here's the problem. Our natural circumstances, many times they're factually true, they're valid, but they can still overwhelm our faith. You know, if you, if you come home every day and watch a bunch of news and you start hearing all the grim news reports of how this coronavirus is taking over things and how many people are dying, then if you go to the, the, the website where there's the world meter for the coronavirus and you're like, gosh, you see all the, all the new cases every day, you see the death toll tally getting higher and higher, man, it can really, it can really be overwhelming and just because it's factual doesn't mean it's good for us to focus on. When I, when I went to uh, Home Depot last week to get the, you know, to get the fertilizer I was talking about, uh, I, I was trying, I was trying to avoid people. You know, I mean, I, just a self-evaluation if I see someone that doesn't look good or if I see someone that I think is potentially sick. I just go down a different aisle, man. I just, you know, I'm just going down a different aisle. And if I have to break the six-foot barrier, you know, I don't have a mask, so I just hold my breath. 
going in, man, I'm doing my business and, and, and getting out again. Now, some of you are laughing at me, but you do the same exact thing. How many of you, when your family, when you're, if you have young kids or when your kids were young, uh, when you went, on a, you went on a vacation, you're driving, if you went through a long tunnel, everyone held their breath, played the game, who can hold their breath at the tunnel? And uh, you realize, man, sometimes you're driving, and man, that tunnel is long. You're like, oh, you know, trying not to pass out before you get through the tunnel. But I, anyway, I left Home Depot, and man, when I was walking out in the parking lot, I just started to not feel good. You know, I'm, I'm hearing all this new stuff. I, I'm around all these people, and, and I just started not to feel good. So I go home, and later that night I tell Tracy, man, I think maybe I have a fever. Could you put your hand on my forehead? And, and she does so, but her hand is hotter than my forehead. So she's like, ah, oh, you don't have a fever. You, you know, you're, my hand's hotter than your forehead. But I'm thinking we're both goners, you know. It's like I know I got something, and, and then she's hotter than I am. And, but how many of you know that... That is fear talking. That is letting fear, the natural circumstances of life, get into your head and get into your heart. So fear feeds on the natural circumstances around us. So we we just have to learn to block some of that out or fear is going to overwhelm us. But faith, our faith feeds on the truth of God's word. In church, now more than ever, we have to get a steady diet of God's word. We, we have to get into God's word and just let the truth of God's word cleanse us from all the fears, just wash over us, and really the word of God will change your perspective. If you're, if you're focused on the circumstances of what's going on around you, uh, you know, that becomes your truth. But if you focus on the truth of God's word, uh, that sends you and puts you on a different path. There, of course, there's, there's probably hundreds of faith-filled scriptures you can read. But let me read one of my favorites from Psalms 91, verse 1 through 7. And it says this, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. So there is dwelling in his shelter, and you will find rest in his shadow. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare, And from the deadly pestilence, he will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart, and you will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. And that's just a a beautiful illustration that, uh, you know, think about just as we try to protect our children. Every parent out there, you love your children. You're trying to protect them. You're trying to shield them from all the things that are going on out there in life. And in the same way, God is, God is our Father. And, and, so, and he, had, he he's, he's, he's huge. His wings are massive. And it's almost like he covers you. And under your wings, he protects you from these things, the deadly pestilence, the plagues that come. And so... What I'm saying is, you know, God is certainly big enough to care for us. God is certainly big enough to protect us during this crisis we're going through. This morning, uh, what I want to do is I want to look at a story in the Old Testament that paints a, a vivid picture of a terrible crisis situation that the nation of Israel went through many years ago. It's in 2 Kings chapter 6 and 7. And what I want to do before we turn there, before they put that on the screen, I want to talk to you just a little bit so you can understand kind of the biblical history of where we're at and what's going on. And so in about 930 B.C., the nation of Israel divided. And it split that there's a southern kingdom, which is called Judah. It had the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. And the northern tribes... Uh, they're referred to after the division as just Israel. And they're the northern ten tribes, and they moved their capital up to, uh, up to Samaria. And so this is happening to the northern tribes, which is called Israel. And Joram is king of Israel. And their neighbors, the Syrians, led by a tremendous leader named Benadad, they come and they, they, they lay siege to Samaria. And now Samaria was a fortified city. It had a wall. It would have had ample supplies of food and 
and, and water and, and everything they would need to withstand a siege. But the Bible says that it lasted so long that their supplies were exhausted. I mean, it's a terrible situation. Uh, people are starving. Uh, they're out of food. Uh, people, they start killing and eating their animals, which was their livelihood. And it, it even got so bad where there's a story of cannibalism. People killing their babies to eat their, eat their babies. Can you imagine how bad this situation would have been? As a matter of fact, the story goes like this, that a woman comes up and talks to the king, and she's distressed. The king asks her, you know, what's wrong? And she said, me and this lady over here, we made a deal that I would, I would kill my baby, and we would eat it today, and tomorrow we would kill her baby and, 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 and eat its flesh. And so... I sacrificed my child for our food, and she's hid her child. And, of course, the king just tore his clothes and went in sackcloth and ashes. I mean, can you imagine how bad this scenario was? Well, also in Samaria was the prophet Elisha. And Elisha gets a word from the Lord that he takes to the king, and he says, King, this is the word of the Lord to you. By this time tomorrow, food will be selling for the proper price. Food will be selling at the proper price and as of tomorrow, and, you know, they mocked him, they laughed at him, and he says, it's fine if you don't believe me, but King, that is the word of the Lord to you. And so now let's pick up the story. It's in Second Kings 7 and verse 3. It says, now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate, and they said to each other, why stay here until we die? If we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there, and we will die. If we, if we stay here, uh, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, we die. And at dusk, they got up and went to the camp of the Arameans. And when they had reached the edge of the camp, no one was there, for the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army, so that they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to attack us. And so they got up and fled in the, in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and their donkeys. They left the camp as it, as it was and ran for their lives. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp, entered one of the tents and ate and drank. Then they took silver, gold, and clothes and went off and hid them. And they returned and entered another tent and took some, of the, some, from, some things from it and hid them also. Then they said to each other, what we are doing is not right. This is a day of good news, and we, and we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. And so uh, quite a dramatic story. And, uh, you know, I was, uh, as I was reading this story, again, I just tried to, sometimes we read stories, we read history, we read the Bible, but we really don't stop to think what the situation was. And uh, I think sometimes when you do that, you'll appreciate that even sometimes when we're in bad situations, they're not near as bad as what other people around the world and in history have gone through. But I tried to imagine how bad the situation must have really been. I mean, people are turning for each other. If you imagine people are starving, there's death. There's dead bodies all in the city of Samaria. They can't do anything with them. The stench of death is in the air. You have people killing, slaughtering their animals for food. We have at least one story of cannibalism where people are, are eating other human beings. And, you know, the situation has escalated to fear, panic, and hysteria. And then, just like that, God provides a miracle for the nation of Israel, and he brings their deliverance. I was reflecting this week, and, and I was really thinking, uh, and, and, you know, one of, the, one of the things that really dawned on me was that even during a crisis situation, God can bring some good out of it. Even in a crisis situation, God can use a crisis to bring benefits into our lives that we never, that we never really thought of. And sometimes we're so focused on the circumstances of the crisis that we don't see that God is doing some things in our life that can benefit us down the road. And so I want to encourage you. I want, I want to talk about, take three principles this morning from this crisis situation we read in the Bible and, and kind of apply it to what we're going through in the world today. 
And I just, hopefully you'll start thinking. I know none of us want to be in a crisis. And no, I, no one wants to see people die. And no one wants to see people lose jobs. But what if during this crisis, we could come out on the other side stronger because we learned some things and we, and we benefited from some things during the crisis. And, of course, we give God the glory for this. The first thing is this, very simple. A crisis causes us to think differently. I mean, a crisis, it just causes us to think differently. Everyone here today, you're thinking differently today than you were three or four weeks ago. You're just, you're thinking differently. These four lepers, they're, they're, they're sitting around in their misery, and they begin to have a dialogue with each other. And, you know, they're sitting there and they're saying, well, you know, if we stay here, we're going to die. That's not a good idea. If we break into the city where we're not even allowed because we're lepers, if we go in there, well, they're, they're no better than we are. There's people dying in there from starvation. But, but what if? What if we threw ourselves on the mercy of the enemy army? What if we went to the Aramean camp? I mean, what if we went there, and I mean, if they kill us, they kill us, we're going to die here, but, but what if they give us something to eat? What if, what if they take us in? I mean, we, we don't know, but we know the other two alternatives are bad, so we, we might as well try this. And uh, so we see that, really, they, they had an out-of-the-box idea. They had a creative idea that could possibly solve their problems. And, you know, right now, the whole world is changing because we have to. Nothing really is the same as it was three or four weeks ago. The crisis situation has forced us to think of new ways of living, new ways of doing business, new ways of educating our children and our college students, and even new ways of worship. And, you know, many of these new ideas that we have in this crisis, uh, they're not going to make it in the long run. But I promise you, some people, because they're thinking differently, they're going to have some game-changing ideas that revolutionize the way certain sectors of our economy and, and our, our society work. And I'm a, I'm a little embarrassed to, to admit to this, but everyone seems to, you know, the congregation always seems to like it when I throw myself under the bus, so I'll do this. But, you know, I realized after this has been going that there are really some areas in my life that I got into a rut. You know, it's been working, so I'm just going to keep doing it the same way. And that, that's what human nature does. When all of us, when we have something that works, we ride it until it dies. And when it's dead, we still kick it a little bit and prod it, and we're trying to get it up and, and, and make it to go. And so one of the benefits of a crisis is that it forces us to think differently. And the bottom line is that human beings, human nature, we normally don't like change. If I got 10 of you in a room and I said, hey, we're going to talk about some changes, uh, it wouldn't be really a very pleasant conversation because human beings just normally don't like change. As a matter of fact, 80% of people, the only change they like is when it's their idea. And then after, a lot of people uh, later down the road, they don't even like the idea that, that they came up with. But, you know, we had been, our church, we had been planning for, gosh, we've been planning for a year to start filming our services and, and start putting it online. But how many of you know that when the county told me we weren't going to meet, I got a little kick in the butt. You know, I got, I got going. I went from thinking about it to we're going to make this happen in two days. And, and e you know, even now we've, we've ordered cameras to put in our, con our congregation. And, and so that from now on, even when we can meet again, we're still going to send the service out. And, it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed, but we're having people from all over the United States and all over our city that have never heard about family life watch this. But what happened? the crisis situation, it forced me to think differently. It forced me to make a decision that, yeah, I know I should do that. Yeah, I probably should do that. But it forced me to make some changes. And obviously I know that a, a church service is never as good online as it's going to be in a building. But at least you, you get it. You're able to connect with it. And, you know, one of the game changers uh, for me as, as I've been thinking during this crisis is, is in discipleship. The hardest thing for churches in the 21, 21st century is to disciple their people. And the main problem is uh, because people have so much time constraints that it's really difficult to, to come to a building. And, 
you know, the Holy Spirit was speaking to me one day and he said, you know, Terry, you've taught through so many books of the Bible in, in the 20 years you've been pastoring. Why aren't all those online? You know, I didn't have a good answer. I didn't have a good answer. And the, the good answer is because, well, I'd rather people come to church, you know. But think about that. So we started this book of Philippians on Wednesday night. And um, we're, we're, we're filming those and putting those online. And gosh, we, we've had hundreds of people already watch them. And, and so we're going to keep doing this. And as we move on, we're, I'm going to keep filming every week. And before long, we'll have a number of books of the Bible you know, on the internet. And so, I mean, the deal is, yeah, it's better to come into a class with other people to talk, but, but how many know that even if you watch it on your own time, it still allows you to grow. It still allows you, uh, you know, to, to, learn, to learn the Bible. And so, you know, no one wants a crisis, and I'm not glorifying a crisis situation, but they do force you to think differently, and God can use that for his glory. So as we work our way through this coronavirus pandemic, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Allow him to give you creative ideas. Allow him to show you things and give you breakthroughs that will benefit you as, as you move forward. The second thing is, is, is this, is that a crisis situation can lead to a more proactive lifestyle. Uh, if you don't know what proactive means, proactive just means uh, that you have a little bit of fire under you, that, that you're doing things before somebody makes you do them. You're, you're actively pursuing and doing things instead of being reactionary. So th I think this, this crisis, really, it's, it's changed our thinking. Uh, many times we think about doing things, but when there's a crisis situation, for example, we, we, we go from saying, yeah, I should go to the store. Well, maybe I'll go to this afternoon or maybe I'll go tomorrow afternoon or whatever. Now, what are we doing? We're waiting in line. We're going there but an hour before the store's open and the store, the line's wrapped around there. We're waiting in line. And basically what we're saying is, hey, today I am getting that toilet paper. I am for sure getting that toilet paper today. That's still the thing that surprises me the most. I, I just can't believe, uh, I, I just can't believe uh, how hard it is to get just certain necessities. I was laughing about this because several months ago, you know, Tracy kind of buys in bulk and she came home from the store and she got, you know, I don't know, like the, the 48 pack of toilet paper and, and we were, I, was, I was helping her put things away and I physically couldn't put all the toilet paper where they're supposed to go and I went around and counted. I'm like, Trace, please do not buy any more toilet paper for like a couple months. We have like 87 rolls in our house. And uh, so we didn't buy toilet paper for months. I didn't know that she was a prophet, you know. She's storing up, she's storing up, and, and now we're waiting in line to get it. But think about it. These four lepers, they, they were proactive. They didn't just sit there and have a dialogue for 14 days. They had the dialogue, and then they went and did something. And sometimes we talk about things forever. At some point, we got to quit talking about something and we got to take action. Action. We've got to do something. And so they left their camp and, and they, they marched all the way out to where the Arameans were. And when they were proactive, when they did something, when they took action, that's what, that allowed God to bring about uh, the miracle for the nation of Israel. You know, Stephen Covey, he's not alive anymore. He wrote one, one, really a profound book. If you haven't read this book, you should read it. But it's called The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. He did this big study, and he listed there's seven things that successful people do every time. And, you know, today we have all these lectures of what you need to do to make, make people be successful. But the truth is, People have to do things themselves to be successful. And the number one ingredient of a person who's successful is that they're proactive, that they're thinking ahead, that they're doing things before it's, it's, it's dire, it's, it's a dire situation. And so I encourage you to, to maybe pick that book up. But I just want to, I guess what I want to do this morning, I just want to encourage you because uh, this is the time this pandemic, this crisis is different from so many of the other ones. For example, when, when homes flood or there's hurricanes, it just destroys everything and everyone's trying to rebuild. But this pandemic, what it's really done, it's just forced us to get at home. And we really, most people have 
more time than they ever have. And they're just complaining that they're bored. Well, we got to be proactive. You know, instead of watching 17 hours of Netflix in one day, you know, why don't we start reading our Bible? Why, why don't we start doing some classes online? Why don't we start doing some things? God is giving us extra time. How are we going to use that, you know, to, to better ourselves? But, you know, read a book. Read a book. Fix something around the house. Go for a walk. And for Christians, um, I want to give you a little, a little analogy that maybe will help you. If you're in a crisis as Christians, you got to stay on the ship. You got to stay on the ship. And there's four things. Fellowship, worship, discipleship, and stewardship. And those four things, we have to be proactive in fellowship. Well, Terry, how are we going to fellowship with people when we can't even see each other? You know, if you're in our church, you've probably received a call from me. If I have your number, I'm trying to call people and talk to people and make sure everyone's okay. I called one, one of my friends this week, and, and he said, oh, man, it's so good to hear somebody talk. He said, I mean, somebody besides my family. They're talking plenty, right? And he has a wife and three daughters, so I don't know how much he gets to talk. But anyway, he, we, we were talking, but fellowship, I mean, we can text people, we can call people, we can Zoom with people. And so stay in fellowship with your friends. Stay connected to people. Check on your friends and family. Make sure they're doing okay. The second thing is worship. And we don't have to come to a church building to worship. You can play worship music in your house and, and just fill, fill your house with God's presence. Uh, so worship and then discipleship. And again, man, start doing things to help yourself grow spiritually. Start every day getting a systematic way of reading through the Bible. You know, watch our online service. Watch the Philippians Bible study. You know, by the time this is over, you'll be a, you'll be a professional in the book of, of, of Philippians. And, and then, of course, stewardship. And, you know, when, when a crisis comes, we don't quit stewarding the gifts that God has given us. You know, we shouldn't quit giving to the church. I mean, if we're making money, we, and we shouldn't stop developing ourselves. And again, some of you that maybe have a lot of extra time, there's probably a class that you could do online to enhance your career, to, to increase your competency. And so again, let's be proactive. In a few weeks, this is going to be over. And, and hopefully it never comes back. But where are you going to be in a few weeks? Are you going to be in the place where you say that, man, I just squandered you know, hundreds of hours of time just sitting around doing things that weren't important? Or are you going to be one of the people that's proactive and you really dig in and when this thing's over, you're ready to run, but you're better than you were before. So that is an incredible uh, benefit. So a crisis, it can change your thinking. Uh, a crisis can help you become proactive. And the third thing is that a crisis situation can bring us out of isolation. Now, that sounds crazy. That sounds very strange, doesn't it? You know, how can it bring us out of isolation when it's actually putting us in isolation? That's kind of a, you know, kind of a crazy thought. But here's the truth. Many people have been in isolation for years. They just didn't realize it. There are millions of people in America, they can go anywhere they want and they're lonely because they're isolated. There's a part of them uh, inside that has that re it ha doesn't have that relate relational component. I was having a conversation with one of the men in our church uh, this week, and, and he's kind of a quiet guy. And he said, he say, you know, Terry, my wife and I, are, we're kind of introverts. And uh, we probably don't participate near as much as we should. But, um, man, we, I really miss you. And I really miss the people in the church. And he told me he missed me four times in a 10-minute conversation. And I, I was just thinking about that. He's like, he's like, well, he said, I guess I don't feel like I need people when I can go see them. But when I can't, I don't like it, you know. But think about that. A lot of people, we have the freedom to do whatever we want in this country. I, I mean, you know, unless it's a criminal offense or something. But so many times we have the freedom to do anything we want, but we still choose to isolate ourselves. And we don't realize that we do. These four, these four lepers, they, they portray 
a really sad story of isolation. Um, if, you, if you know anything about leprosy, leprosy was a body, was a disease that affected your skin, and it basically just rotted off parts of your body if it got bad enough. And there was no cure for leprosy in first century, so, or even way back even, you know, before this and um, in this story. And, and so what would happen is they were quarantined for life, away from community, away from their family, away from their friends. And the only way they could be welcomed back into community is if their skin healed and they went to a priest and he claimed them as, as clean. And so think about this. And the reason they isolated was because there was no cure and they didn't want it to spread to other members of their, of their house. So these lepers are living out in a little com, commune with other lepers. And, and, uh, but these lepers who the community doesn't want to see, who the community doesn't want to endorse, they're the ones that produce the miracle and they're the heroes that go back and tell the other people of the breakthrough that God has given them. And I was, I was, as I was reading this, I was thinking about, you know, God created all of us for relationships, whether you want to believe it or not. And if we isolate ourselves away from people who can encourage us, people who can uplift us, people who can challenge us, if we isolate ourselves, we don't realize it, but just like the leper, a part of us is dying on the inside. There's a part of us on the inside that we don't even realize it's dying because it's slow over time. As I was studying this week, I realized, you know, there are millions and millions of Americans who have isolated themselves spiritually from God's house and God's people. And there's millions of people who for some reason or another They've just chosen to isolate themselves spiritually, and they're just going through life alone. Sure, they watch church on television. Sure, they listen to the radio. And, and, and honestly, they, they love God. They really do. But they've, they've chosen to isolate themselves, and maybe they had a bad church experience, and so they're just not going to do that again. Maybe a Christian leader just really let them down. Maybe some of their friends in the church hurt them for some reason or another. And um, my prayer, my prayer throughout this crisis situation, I just pray, I'm praying every day that when things get lifted and we're able to worship together, I'm just praying that there's millions of people who come back to the kingdom of God. And, and not that they're not in the kingdom of God, but come, come back to houses of worship. Come back and are restored into, into relationships. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, it says this. Let us think of ways to motivate one another and to acts of love and good works. That's what church is supposed to do. That's what Christian fellowship is supposed to do. We're supposed to think of ways we can motivate one another uh, to love and good works. And, and let us not neglect meeting together as some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is near. And so I was thinking about this. You know, the people isolating themselves spiritually and choosing not to go to God's house and spend time with God's people, that's not new for today. I mean, look what the Hebrews writer says. It was happening way back in the first century. People, for whatever reason, were deciding, I don't need to go to church. I don't need to associate with God's people. I'll just do it. I'll just do it on my own. And so I, I just, I hope, I, prom I make you a promise. I tell people all the time, hey, give family life one year. Give us one year. I mean, go all in for one year and see if in one year your life isn't better um, than it was before. And the truth is, there are 100 churches probably in the Houston area that are good churches and, or wherever you're at. And if you made the one-year commitment, your life would be better. So uh, we'd love you to come to Family Life. But I just want everyone to be in God's house. It makes, a tremendous, it makes a tremendous difference. And when you go back, don't just go every once in a while. Man, make a commitment to go every week. Make a commitment to meet people, to join a Bible study, to join a small group, to find a place to serve. It'll make a difference in your life. I was had a conversation with a lady uh, this week and... and uh, it was a heartfelt conversation, and this, this lady, she, she said, you know, Pastor Terry, 
you know, I've been coming to family life like three months now. And she said, you know, I love God with all my heart. But a number of years ago, I just decided I'm not going to church anymore. She said, I was let down by people in church. She's like, you know, you get close to people, you realize they're not perfect. And, and I just decided I'm going to do this by myself. I love God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to read my Bible. And she said, you know what? As much as I love God, I realized after some time that this wasn't working. It wasn't working because God designed me to be in his house with his people. And here's the truth. God's house and God's people are never perfect. It's never perfect. But she's like, I just wanted to find a place where it was genuine and authentic and, and we could just, I could just really find people. She's like, family life has, has, has become my home. So as we're, as we're finishing up today, uh, my goal has been just to encourage you to live by faith and not fear. You know, there's a battle going on inside of all of us, myself, yourself, and the battle is are we going to live by faith or are we going to fall into fear? And the, the, the truth nugget for today is this, whichever one you feed is the one that will become stronger. So make sure this week that you're feeding your faith that you're getting, being spiritually encouraged, that you're spiritually motivated, reading your Bible and doing the things that help you grow spiritually. And then we talked about how, as crazy as it sounds, a crisis situation uh, can benefit our lives in the future. You know, we can, we can, it forces us to think differently so we can say, Holy Spirit, give us, give me some new ideas, give me some creative ideas that I can move forward with. A, a crisis can lead us to becoming more proactive and, you know, just determine during this crisis, I'm not going to waste a bunch of time. I'm going to be proactive. I'm going to do things that help me become a better person. I'm going to discipline myself to do that. And then a crisis can bring us out of isolation. Sometimes when we're forced into isolation, we realize that, man, I have been self-isolating for years and, and my prayer is that millions of people that God's going to work in their lives and many people are going to come, come home and find a good church family. Church, let me pray for you this morning. Would you just bow your heads and God, I just pray for everyone everyone that is uh, watching this service right now. God, I believe that you ordained them to be here. You predestined it that they would be watching today. And God, I just pray right now for hope to fill every heart, for faith to rise in every home. And God, we just, we put fear under our feet and we just declare that we're going to live by faith. We're going to live by faith. We're going to focus on the things that feed our faith, that give nutrition to our faith in Jesus' name. And, you know, before I, I close this morning, I just want to give everyone a chance here. Maybe there's someone watching this service online and you're just like, man, you know, Terry, I have never given myself to the Lord. I've never given my heart to the Lord. And I'm going to take a moment and I'm just going to lead you in a prayer of salvation. And if you're watching, if you've never given your life to Jesus and you realize, man, I need Jesus in my life. I'm tired of going through life on my own. I'm going to invite you to do that. Father God, we come before you and Lord, we just repent for our own self-sufficiency. God, we repent for our own pride and arrogance. We repent for trying to do everything on our own. And this morning, we realize that I need a Savior. We ask Jesus to come into our hearts, to be our Lord and Savior, to forgive us of our sins. Jesus, we, we give you permission to lead us and guide us throughout this this journey of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer with me this morning, you know, uh, the angels in heaven are rejoicing and your new home is going to be in heaven and you're going to live eternally with Jesus. And I would encourage you, go to our website and send me a little note. I would love to send you some information and be able to encourage you. Well, God bless you this morning. I hope you're encouraged. I hope you're uplifted. uplifted. And we're just going to close this morning's service with a worship song. So let's just let worship fill our hearts this morning. God bless you, and I'll see you next week.